When envisioning the Roman Catholic Church, you might think of images of holy relics, communion, or maybe men with robes deep in prayer. For myself, however, all I can think about now is the horrible acts committed by Pope John XII throughout his tenure as leader of the Church. Today we will be discussing the very swift rise and fall of a Pope with extreme levels of inhumanity, who further marked the lowest and most unholy ranks in nearly two millennia of papacy. In recent years, you might have seen a Hollywood series regarding a young Pope committing heinous crimes against his subjects, the portrayal of a power-drunk young man who holds one of the most influential seats in the world. Although this particular show, supposedly, was not based on any one individual, it might as well have been a biography for His Unholiness Pope John XII, one of the most infamous in history, who holds a tough record of brutality and immorality. Pope John XII, formerly a bishop of Rome named Octavianus, was born in 937 to Alberic II of Spoleto and his mistress. His father, Alberic, was well known for taking power of Rome by overthrowing his mother, who didn't give him enough attention, and his stepfather, who slapped him in public. When Alberic was on his deathbed, he made several elitist families, and even the current dying pope, swear that they would vote in his son, Octavianus, upon the death of this current dying pope. Back in those days, this was exceptionally frowned upon, but Rome was under a lot of stress, from rampant corruption and constant power vacuums anyways, so it actually seems fitting for the times. It was like a constant game of King of the Hill, but with murder instead. Within a year, Octavianus was thrust into power at the age of 18, becoming the youngest owner of the throne to rule the Papal States, ruling from 955 to 964. Ah yes, and he changed his name to John, officially marking his transition into Pope John XII. John XII really hit it out of the park when it comes to corruption, of course, and actually shined a little bit of light on how bad the corruption was becoming and how the systems in place were failing the people of this once great empire. Certainly John was the youngest pope in history. He was also one of the richest most spoiled and privileged teenagers in society at the time. Instead of following spirituality and spreading peace, he was far more interested in gambling, having fun, drinking and hedonistic acts. Considered as the worst pope in history, he, among many other factors, led to the decay and instability in Rome during this time period. This young pope used all his wealth for a lavish lifestyle. Pope John XII turned the most beautiful churches and holy places into what we now know today as brothels. As a power-hungry teenager, already in one of the highest seats in Roman society with many maidens, it was no surprise when he made one of his completely qualified mistresses a governor of a papal city. John was simply attempting to court this fine woman but she was also the widow of a high-level aristocrat. Clearly, she had higher standards than the rest. After noticing John's megalomania, she turned John to her advantage. The woman herself was highly regarded by many, and Pope John had tried persistently to please her. She folded to his desires only when John gave her control of numerous Italian cities. I'm glad to see some people profiting off the situation, the Pope showered women with his wealth, which was largely revenue collected from rising costs of religious donations. John also generated revenue by offering bishophood to the highest bidders. He was so desperate to feed his lifestyle of prostitutes and alcohol that he once ordained a ten-year-old boy, obviously paid for by his parents, and in a separate scenario ordained a man in a stable. Imagine putting together a whole ceremony for your son to receive his new elitist status, like a bar mitzvah or a wedding, and the other guy just does his in a stable. 
It's obvious that church is supposed to be the holiest place, and when entering such an environment, the last thing you can think of is violence or hedonistic acts, but not for John. John did not care, because he never had a desire to be the Pope anyways. It was quite literally forced upon him by his dying father. In order to raise funds for all the parties, John also made the pilgrimage to Rome much more expensive, through extra donations and overall expenses. Only the richest people could afford this journey. He justified his decisions by claiming divine intervention. Basically, God made me do it. It was a great way for him to defend himself and maintain allies with the wealthiest Roman elites. Stories such as these paint a much clearer picture of the papal states under the rule of Pope John XII. Little did this young pope know that the more he was implicating himself in all the malfeasances in the papacy's history, he would also be inviting new enemies. His poor judgment and decision-making led to the gradual decline of society within Rome. Pope John's extravagant lifestyle left him with no wealth. Soon he and Rome altogether were losing resources rapidly, and thus Lee was put under an immense amount of stress due to this poor leadership. One of the greatest threats to his throne was Berengar II of Italy, the nephew of Pope John XII's stepfather who succeeded as the King of Italy. Berengar saw this weakness in the papacy and realized the opportunity. Berengar started campaigning against the poorly equipped army of the papal states. Pope John was genuinely fearful of this because he had no idea how to run a military or make any real decisions for that matter. In 960, Berengar's army had invaded the Papal States. Due to a lack of funding, manpower, and pretty much every other resource, the Papal army was no match against Berengar's forces. With options running dry, Pope John XII had to fall at the feet of Otto of Saxony, East Frankish king, later known as Otto the Great. In exchange for help and support from Otto to defeat Berengar, Otto demanded to be named the Holy Emperor of Rome. Otto was a great, formidable warrior and also an incredible wartime general. He officially succeeded in conquering Bohemia and expanding his territory, also unifying German tribes into one kingdom. According to historians, he was seen as the very image of Christian piety and chivalry. Otto's sights were set on bringing the whole area to its former glory, as it was under Charlemagne. Keep in mind, John was only about 23 years old at the time of all this happening, and most of his free time was spent enjoying humanistic pleasures and murdering his own citizens, rather than learning military techniques or gaining actual political influence. In the eyes of Otto, John's appeal for help against Berengar was quite frankly a young and ignorant ruler asking for help bailing himself out of a sticky situation. Otto, realizing this sticky situation and opportunity at hand, took advantage. A little game of I scratch your back, you make me Holy Roman Emperor. Pope John, of course, had no other option but to agree and promise the throne. Soon after defending the Papal States against Berengar, Otto became the first Holy Emperor since 924. He also made John sign a papal treaty to limit his power. Many citizens were deeply concerned and very unhappy to see a German becoming a Holy Emperor. But for John, he couldn't care less. Otto promised to defend the papal states and also reclaim land lost to Berengar. Otto, being the righteous man he was, advised John that he needs to learn some responsibility because obviously the whole place is falling apart. John didn't really like being bossed around by Otto or being told how to run his kingdom. To John, Otto was just a tool to be used for the time being. And to Otto, John was an ignorant teenager whose vision for Rome didn't see past his own nose. John also strongly disliked Otto for not fearing him and being pious. Otto wanted John to change his actions and would discuss the issues related to the church. For John, it was something very boring. 
Surprisingly, Pope John was never really a trustworthy individual. After all the support and help he received from Otto, as soon as Otto had left to fight, Pope John started forming a plot against Otto. John perceived that Otto was abusing his power that he had bestowed upon him. Rather, John wanted an instrument that he could utilize to enact his own policies and desires. A letter sent to Otto while he was away fighting stated, The palace of the Lateran, which had once sheltered saints, was now a harlot's brothel. Because of this conflict between Pope John and Emperor Otto, John became vicious and began plotting the downfall of Otto. John would even go so far as to start forming an alliance with none other than, yes, you've guessed it, Berengar and his son, Aldebert. Fortunately, John's constituents, for lack of a better term, realized that someone was finally standing against their horrible ruler. In the eyes of the citizens, Otto was someone who could control John and at least implement some sort of order. In fact, John's own servants would send letters to Otto, stating that the person he was aiding was the same person plotting against him. This became one of the most important turning points of the entire situation, at least in Otto's perspective. As soon as Otto was informed of these dealings with the very people he was fighting, he was furious and livid for obvious reasons, and began his journey back to Rome to confront this wild pope. Meanwhile, John, informed of Otto's return, was sneakily trying to make a getaway with all the papal treasures to Tivoli with his new friend Aldebert, rather than face Otto and the German army. Word of Otto's arrival had spread throughout the whole country. However, John enjoyed his time away from Rome because all of the earthly lavishes he had taken with him were comforting and, in his eyes, showed that he was safe if only for the time being. Upon Otto's return from battling Berengar, he had found that Pope John had fled the empire on a very well-timed hunting trip. Otto then gathered a council of high-ranking church officials in order to officially try John for his crimes. The council had compiled a list of crimes of which John would face penalties for. This list included, but of course was not limited to, making toasts to the devil, requesting favor from pagan gods while gambling, blinding a guy named Benedict, and even castrating a cardinal, then, shortly after, killing said cardinal. Otto had told John that no harm would come to him if he just came back and answered to these accusations, which is sort of believable because previously Otto had attempted to calm the leaders of the church by basically stating that, he is only a boy, and that he just needs a good, strong father figure to teach him about responsibility. You could say Otto had a sort of soft spot for John. Either that, or he was just more concerned with reclaiming the motherland and didn't want to deal with it. Pope John took extreme offence to the accusations and replied by essentially giving the equivalent of a no you to the bishops and Otto promising to excommunicate them if they tried to put a new pope in place. The church officials, confident in Otto's abilities to protect them, excommunicated John and elected a new pope named Leo VIII. Believe it or not, Roman citizens were furious with this decision because they viewed Leo as a puppet for the Emperor Otto, who wasn't even a Roman in the first place. The citizens tried to revolt, but their efforts were squandered by Otto's occupational forces. Due to the ongoing war with Berengar, Otto was unable to remain in Rome and contend with the riots and turmoil. He returned to the battle, confident in his interim pope's abilities to maintain the empire. Almost instantly after Otto left Rome, John made his coincidental return to reclaim the papacy for himself. John proceeds to enact revenge on all the bishops, cardinals, and other church officials that tried to remove him from the seat of power. There are many stories of him cutting off people's hands, tongues, and other body parts. In retaliation to Otto's council, John got together his own council and undid all the changes that Otto made, and also excommunicated poor Leo VIII. 
A couple of months following his return and rampage, on May the 14th in the year of 964, John suddenly passed away. Historians are not at a complete agreement on exactly how he died. Some say he had overexerted himself while in the sheets with his mistress. Others say that he passed due to complications from getting horribly beaten up by one of his mistress's husbands. I prefer the latter because it is funnier and fits the story quite nicely. But I'll let you decide what you want to believe. And that, my friends, is the story of Pope John XII, worst pope in history. To think this all started because Alberic just wanted to keep the royalty in his bloodline. I hope you enjoyed the story, and if you did, please consider liking and subscribing. Thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you all in the next one.